Welcome to Preaching That Matters. A place you can find apostolic Pentecostal preaching. A place where all generations can be fed with the Word of God. We hope you enjoy.
sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah we sing hallelujah the lamb is overcome remarkable mercies are innumerable strength is impenetrable he is beyond comprehension further than imagination constant through generations king of every nation but if there are words for him then I don't have them you see my words are few and to try to capture the one true God using my vocabulary will never do but I use words as an expression, an expression to worship a savior, a savior who is both worthy and deserving of my praise, so I use words. My heart extols the Lord, blesses his name forever. He has won my heart, captured my mind, and bound them both together. He has defeated me in my rebellion, captured me in my sin, he has welcomed me into his presence, completely inviting me in. He has made himself the object of my sight, flooding me with mercies in the morning, drowning me with grace in the night. But if there are words for him, then I don't have them. But what I do have is good news. For my God knew that man-made words would never do. For words are just tools that we use to point to the truth. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, the living word, as proof. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created, giving nothingness formation. Holy is his name, so praise him for his life. persevered in strife the son of God becoming the ultimate sacrifice praise him for his death that he willingly stood in our place that he lovingly endured the grave that he battled our enemy and on the third day he rose in victory he is everything that was promised praise him as the risen king your voice and sing for one day he will return to us and we will be united with him for eternity so you see it's not just words that I proclaim for my words 
point to the word and the word has a name hope has a name joy has a name peace has a name love has a name and that name is Jesus Christ praise his name forever
feel the reality of that risen Christ in this building right now. You feel, you feel the reality of it. Not just, it's not just a celebration one time a year. It said he walks and talks with us every day if we let him. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. One more time. Would you just lift your voice and your praise to the Lord? Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you, Lord. Wonderful, Lord. Wonderful, Jesus. Hallelujah to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise your name. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. You're worthy. You're the only one that's worthy, Lord. You're the only one that's worthy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. I feel a confirmation in my spirit. There is a desire for the Lord to reach people today that have doubt. And I understand we have, that have experienced this resurrection enjoy that celebration today. But there are others here today that I know the Lord is trying to reach out to you and, and tell you, uh, you can enter into his resurrection. It's not just for a historical uh, fact. It is for you to experience that resurrection. All right, the Lord is speaking to us today. I want to give you what the Lord gave me, and you'll see how it fits in with these two uh, words from the Lord. The Lord is speaking to us today about that doubt that he, he feels and senses, and and that's what he wants to deal with today because people uh, are on both sides of the issue today. And Easter is, is more than just some type of celebration. It is a reality. It's, it's not technically Easter. That's a, we borrowed that from the pagans, actually. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a reality. Uh, and <clears throat> here's the truth. People react differently to these realities. People reacted differently uh, to Jesus' life. They, uh, scripture bears out that some believed and some doubted. 
you remember the scenes from the play where none of his siblings believed until after his resurrection. His siblings gave him a hard time. Uh, when Jesus walked the earth, some said he was a prophet, others said he was a devil. Last Sunday I preached about his triumphal entry excuse me, into Jerusalem. And some sang Hosanna while the Pharisees wanted to stop them and they were plotting to kill Jesus. There were different reactions not only to his life, but there were different reactions to his death. You see the people around the cross and the soldiers, some gambled for his clothing. One scholar assumes that Jesus hangs naked while they gamble for his clothing in the cold. If you're to believe that, that Peter warmed his hands by a fire, there was a fire there for a reason. And the soldiers, but one soldier had an epiphany in the middle of all of that and said, surely this was the son of God. The reactions, the Jews. I don't know what the Jews did around the cross. They crucified, uh, the Jewish leadership crucified Jesus Christ. But Jesus on the cross begins to quote Psalm 22, something that would have been very familiar to all of the Jews. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And any good Jew would begin reciting that psalm. But that's the psalm that tells how they pierced his hands and his feet. I think Jesus was dropping hints to the Jewish nation that what was prophesied was happening right before their eyes. <coughs> The disciples scattered, but at least two are mentioned. Peter and John. They're on different sides of the narrative. John is close to Jesus. Peter is denying Jesus. But he's in close proximity, close enough to see him. The rest weren't anywhere around. There are not only different reactions to his life and to his death, but there were different reactions to his resurrection. And we're on one side or the other of that today. Amen? I am going to be reading from the book of John. John has the longest resurrection narrative of the four gospels, it is a full two chapters. And it's interesting that the beginning and the end of these chapters frame John's account by comparing and contrasting Peter and the beloved disciple, John. There's a bit of tension between the two disciples. And it's clear that in this gospel, the beloved disciple is the star, and he's highly esteemed and beloved by Jesus. But in chapter 20 and in chapter 21, Peter's leadership is recognized. I don't mean to imply that there was an explicit rivalry between the two, because the gospel narrative uh, portrays them as friends and not as rivals. At the Last Supper, John conveys Peter's question to Jesus. And in the 21st chapter, in the 7th verse, they're fishing together. So I don't think they're enemies. But there are contrasts. You see, Luke left John out of his earlier narrative. And John sets the record straight when he writes his book, which is the last of the Gospels, written in John's later years. Peter's most likely dead at the time, so now the story can be told. John beat Peter in the foot race. <laughs> Luke 
Luke's account said, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. So John's narrative mentions that they run together to the tomb. We assume they start out from the same place. And at the end of the gospel, after a seemingly humiliating fate is predicted of Peter, we learn that John may be let off more lightly. At the end of John's narrative, you have this discussion with Jesus and he indicates to Peter that his end may be somewhat similar to Jesus. And Simon Peter, still being Simon Peter, says, what about this guy? And Jesus seems to indicate a different fate for John. John's 20th chapter opens on the third day after Jesus' crucifixion and burial, early on the first day of the week, which would make it Sunday. Here's the text. Now on the first day of the week, do we have it? We got it? There it is. Uh, Did you get my PowerPoint? No? Wow. Wow. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved. You're going to recognize that's how John describes himself throughout his gospel. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, Yet he did not go in. He saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. Everybody say he went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' most committed female followers, is present in all four gospel accounts. But here she is alone before the sunrise. Mark 16, 1, Luke 24, 1, the women are heading for the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. In John It has already been done. When Mary Magdalene saw that the stone had been removed, she runs to tell Simon Peter and the beloved disciple, assuming that someone's taken the body from the tomb. It's also recorded in the book of Matthew, the same passage. Both disciples run to the tomb, but John outruns Simon Peter. One scholar indicated that it was because Simon was older. One scholar indicated, believe it or not, that it was because Simon uh, was married that he didn't run as fast as John. I guess he thought that when you're married... 
you're working so hard that, that, that anybody can outrun you. I don't know. That's tough, isn't it? Don't know why he outran him, but he outran him. John stops without going in. He stops and looks at the grave clothes. Now, there's this contrast. I know that John is portrayed as more contemplative and that Simon Peter is portrayed as more impetuous and, and, and quick to react. But there's something happening here. John looks in and sees the burial clothes and the linen clothes were lying there. Now, let me just say as a side note, no one who came to steal the body would have taken time to unwrap it. Wouldn't make good sense for somebody robbing the grave to take the time, especially with a Roman seal on it, to take the time to unwrap the body. You know, when Lazarus came out, he was pretty tied up. Jesus' grave clothes were still in the grave. You assume on a shelf that they had for people to be buried on the morning light filtering in and John sees the clothes. But he waits. Why did John hesitate? Was he out of breath? Had he just run too fast and too hard? Was he, was he exhausted? Perhaps he was concerned with ritual contamination that's connected with a corpse. Was it the fear of the unknown? Was he content with just being an observer? Why did he hesitate? He was the disciple whom Jesus loved. He bears that out over and over again. He had a special relationship with Jesus Christ. His head was on his chest at the Last Supper. But sometimes people that love deeply can be hurt deeply. Maybe it was the injury that he felt in his own spirit that made him hesitate. But to John, the tomb was a window. And windows and glass is put around things so that people can observe them. It may even be something valuable. But a window is a separation. And John stepped up to the window of the resurrection. Peter, on the other hand, does not hesitate. Peter begins to run past the quicker John and runs into the tomb because Peter does not approach the tomb as a window. Peter approaches the tomb as a door. Maybe Peter's impetuous nature finally found the right context and the right expression. Perhaps it harkens back to his revelation where John was quiet and Jesus asked, Who do you say that I am? 
Simon Peter was quick with the revelation. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. He won the day. He, he got the answer right. So looking back, you see the leadership of Simon Peter. And looking forward, you see the foreshadowing of his boldness on the day of Pentecost, who stood up empowered by the Spirit of Almighty God to proclaim this same Jesus that you crucified has been made Lord and Christ. He is the Lord. You have crucified the Messiah. He preached for them to repent and to be baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of their sins and the infilling of the gift of the Holy Ghost. It was promised. Why? Because Peter came to the resurrection and did not see it as a window. The resurrection is an event to be experienced not only observed. The title of my message is Reluctance Meets the Resurrection. Reluctance Meets the Resurrection. It makes me think of the old story about the fisherman. He, he was out and he caught so many fish every time he went out. And uh, nobody could figure out how, how they weren't, they were getting a few bites, but he was always coming back with a boatload of fish. And finally, the game warden talked to him and, and wanted to find out his secret. He said, well, I'll show you. I won't tell you, I'll show you. Just come with me fishing tomorrow. So he got in the boat with the, <clears throat> the fisherman and he, they got out in the middle of the lake and <clears throat> the fisherman lit a stick of dynamite and threw it over the side. Directly, he heard that muffled boom, and man, the fish just started floating right up to the top. He got his little net out and started scooping them up. <sighs> that game warden said he, could, he was speechless. He was stuttering and stammering, and he said, well, I'm going to throw you under the jail. I, I can't believe you'd come out here and what kind of sport is that throwing dynamite into the river here? I am going to handcuff you. And about that time, that fisherman lit another stick of dynamite and threw it in his lap. He said, you going to talk or you going to fish? That'll change you from being a spectator to being a participator. You're going to talk, you're going to fish. You know what? When it comes to the tomb, it's not designed to be a window. It's not designed for somebody to come around once a year and admire it. It's not designed for somebody to say, oh, what a pretty historical fact that Jesus came and gave his life on Calvary and rose from the dead. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Don't stop and just look in the window at his grave clothes. It's time to understand the resurrection is a door. It's not a window. Why, 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 John? Why do you need to experience the resurrection? I'm talking to people here under the sound of my voice. God's tried to talk to you twice already today. People that treat this promise as something that happened in the past but doesn't affect the present. Why? Why should we enter in to the resurrection? Well, I want you to understand, first of all, because the fact that Jesus loves you is not enough. John knew that Jesus loved him, but that's not enough, John. 
Jesus loves everybody in this room right now. Can I tell you something? That doesn't mean everybody's ready for heaven. I read about a young rich man that approached Jesus and Jesus loved him, but he went away sorrowfully. Just because Jesus loved him didn't save him. You can come in this place and feel the presence of God week in and week out, but it doesn't mean that you have that relationship. You gotta get past the doorway. You gotta walk in for yourself. You gotta say this is not something that I can observe from a distance. This isn't just a pretty platitude. This isn't just a nice story in the gospels. I gotta have my own personal resurrection. I've gotta have my own experience with the risen Christ. It is popular today to believe that God loves everyone too much to let anyone go to hell. It's popular. Universalism is so widespread in Christianity. The belief that no one's going to hell. Everybody's going to be redeemed. They twist the scriptures. Brother Javon, they try to say even the devil and his angels are going to make it. It's not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. It's not enough to just know what Jesus did. It's not even enough to just make some mental assent or some decision or accept the Lord as your Savior. Find the scripture for that. If you find a scripture, you probably go to John 3, 16 and say, God so loved the world that, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. But you got to start out with John 3, 5 where he said, except a man is born again of the water and the spirit, he can't even see the kingdom of God. Just because you observe the trappings of his miracle. That's not enough. John, just because you're looking in and you see that he's gone, that's not enough. Just observing what Jesus has done and just, just believing doctrinal truth is not enough. You must appropriate it. It must be your own personal resurrection. You must go in and you too will be changed. I understand there's a redemptive uh, part of this story and there's this whole ransom that Jesus paid for us and that is so true and that was uh, as as some would say, that was a specific moment in time. I understand there was a Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. That's not the question. The question is, are you still standing outside of that experience? Looking in. How does that affect me today? You must go in and you too will be changed. You know, the Bible narrative lets us know that when Simon Peter went in and he experienced the inside of the tomb, that it made a difference in John. And finally, John came in as well and believed. What are you saying? I'm saying you don't have to stay where you are. 
You don't have to keep looking through the window and saying, you know, I know there's something that God wants to do in my life. I know he wants me to experience more. I know he wants to fill me with his spirit. I know he wants to wash away my sins. Don't look at it from the outside. Take that step into the resurrection tomb and let God do it for you in your life. I'm talking to people that have already been filled with the Holy Ghost as well. And the devil's beat you down and tried to keep you out of that joy and that resurrection power. Don't just look at the grave clothes and say, yes, I believe God is a miracle worker. Yes, I believe God is alive. Yes, I believe God is is supernatural. You have to step into that realm. You have to step in to that realm and experience it for yourself. It is not God's will for you to feel Feel like you're on the outside of that. Why do people hesitate today? Perhaps you're tired of running like John. Perhaps you've been disappointed with religion. Perhaps you've been hurt by a prayer that's gone unanswered. Perhaps you're convinced that being good is enough. It's not. Perhaps you're bewildered by what you see and you don't understand. Perhaps you feel let down by God. God has somehow failed you because you still can't pay all the bills or you remain sick or childless or single or in an abusive marriage whatever the reason is, don't stand outside and look at the miracle. Whatever the reason, each of us must go beyond looking at the gospel and the resurrection through the window and we've got to experience it ourselves. Would you look at the language in the Bible? The Bible says... It's not just about his death on Calvary. It's about us dying with him. The the scripture says in Galatians, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What are you saying? I died with him. That's not up to him. That's up to you. Everybody say with him. him. He wants you to experience the gospel. The scripture says, therefore we are, or we were buried with him. Everybody say "With with him. Through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I was buried with him so I could rise with him. That's what the gospel is all about. Step into the tomb. Step into the light of the tomb. Step into the power of his resurrection because he is still changing lives today. Everybody say buried with him in baptism. That's how we appropriate the gospel. Paul said to the Colossians, you're raised with Christ. If then you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Raised with Christ. I was resurrected with Christ. 
I died with him and I rose with him. I had my own personal Easter resurrection morning. I remember when I was laying between the pew and I had given my heart to Jesus Christ. I had been baptized in his name uh, years ago, but I remember the night I received the gift of the Holy Ghost and that dead spirit was filled with the same spirit that was in that tomb. It came into my heart and it resurrected me. Is there any witness in the house? Is there anybody that's had a personal Easter? Is there anybody that's ever been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost? We are risen with him. Risen with him. Just remain standing. Paul said to the Thessalonians, to the end he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. If I die with him, if I'm buried with him, if I'm risen with him, I'm coming back with him. <laughs> Whoo, glory. What a day when Christ returns with his saints. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You say, Pastor, you don't understand. I'm so weak. I can't do it. Here's the good news. None of us can. That's the same for everybody. It's impossible. But that's because we can't do it standing outside. But the moment you take that step into his power, into his domain, death could not hold him down. He is the risen king. I love it. I, I, I texted Sister Horde yesterday and I said, is there anybody who knows the song forever? She said, we're already practicing it to do it uh, with the ensemble tomorrow. How beautiful. Forever he is lifted high. Forever he is alive. That's not good enough for me. I want to be alive with him. I want that life in me. I want that joy in me. I want that power in me. Selfishly, no, 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 no. I know I can't make it, but I can do all things through Christ with strength. What are you talking about? When I walk in his spirit, when I walk in that resurrection power, there's all the joy I need. I'm telling you, he conquered death, hell, and the grave. He conquered sin. If I need power over the sin, all I gotta do is step into his resurrection. If I need power over hell. All I need to do is step into his resurrection. If I need power over the devil, all I need to do is step into his resurrection. I got to get past the doorway and I got to get in there where everything miraculous happens. The reluctance is gone. John finally came in and he believed. He believed. He's gone, Simon Peter. He really did it. The Bible said they still didn't remember the verses that, that, that he told them he was going to rise again. That still didn't even, it wasn't even based on what he said is based on what they saw and what they felt and, 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 the, and the miracle of that moment. What if it was you that got to that tomb? Would you stand and look from the outside? Or would you step in and say, God, I want to be resurrected too. I want to be resurrected too. His power is here today. 
the same power that got him up out of that grave is here right now. We felt it all service long. God's been talking to people. He wants to be as real to you, better than your best friend. That's what he said to us, isn't it? I'm not real to you, but he can be. Would you step in to the resurrection tomb today and let him change your life? I want to open up these altars right now. I want everyone to come. Bring somebody with you. It's Easter. If there's any time that we ought to talk to the Lord, it's right now. Jesus has done it. I want to enter in to that promise. Death no longer has dominion over him. He's won the battle. He's won the battle. He's the first and the last, book of Revelation says, who was dead and came to life. He's the one who lives forever and ever. And he's in this place to help you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Would you bring your reluctance to his resurrection? Give it to him. Lord Jesus, I want your power alive in me. You can repent of your sin. You can give it all to God. We all have to do that. You just say, Lord, I'm sorry. Things in my life that's offended you. And I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He's ready. He's ready. You can be baptized in Jesus' name. That's the only way anybody was baptized by the apostles in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He will fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. He's here right now. He's here right now. Come on, somebody step in. Somebody take the step past the door. Thank the Lord, thank the Lord. What a miracle, what a miracle that he died for you and that he rose again. What a miracle. You can experience that miracle today. You can experience his miracle power. I believe you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. I want to experience, Lord, your resurrection power.